Thank you, Brother Bob, for it. And good evening, friend. It's a pleasure to be back here again tonight to serve the Lord. And I'm very happy to see you people gather out in this time of worship. I just, just shook hands with an old friend of mine from down in Miami. It reminds me of seemed like I wouldn't feel like coming to Florida if I didn't get to see what we call Billy Jim. And so I'm very happy to have him here with us tonight on the platform. Much water has passed down the river since I've seen you last, Billy Jim, from many places around the world. Going again, if God willing, in the near future, we are very happy that God did what he did for the people this afternoon, blessing them. And I trust now that right quick, I've been some right two hours or more constantly praying, and I just want to testify a little tonight and then go right into the service. First, I shall read some of his word, and knowing that his word is perfect and will never fail, it's found in the fourth chapter of St. John, beginning with the 46th verse. Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was coming out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come here, my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, the servant came to him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. And he inquired of them the hour he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth and himself believed in all of his household. This is again the second miracle which Jesus did when he came out of Judea into Galilee. And we bow our heads now while we speak to him just a moment in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We will worship thee tonight, our Father, in the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And we love thee because that thou hast first loved us and redeemed us from a life of sin and has given us a heart of worship. And we have praised thee and received tonight, O God, the adoration of our hearts as we pour it out in simplicity to thee, loving thee and knowing this, that thou alone holds our lives, and someday we must meet thee face to face and give an account for our life here on earth. What type of people should we be then, Father? We can do nothing except thou will help us. And tonight, all this little group of people gathered together here on the evening of the Sabbath. We thank thee for this lovely day and for the many sermons and the ministers across the world who preached the gospel, all the souls that have believed on thee, the great miracles and wonders, no doubt around the world, being performed right now. And dear Savior, don't pass us tonight. We pray that you will come in your magnificent power and will lay thy healing wings across this building. And may every sick person in here be filled with healing power. Grant it, Lord. May, as the prophet said, the distilled dewdrops of mercy bathe our souls until we see the purpose that Jesus uh, came to redeem us from sickness and sin and to set us free and to give us a happy life of service, winning others for him. These blessings we, we ask thee to grant to us unworthy ones, in the name of thy Son, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Just a testimony tonight. Taking so much of your time to say to me and preaching. My son told me, he said, Dad, you didn't realize you were there about an hour and 45 minutes. But it was, oh, I, I just love to talk about him so much, but I just can't get through talking. I've been 23 years now in the ministry, and I'm I went into the ministry and I was just a boy. And the only regret that I had, that I could say in my life, of one thing that I regret more than anything else, that I didn't know Jesus when I was just a little bitty boy. 
I wish I could turn it back. Every hour of my life, I would give for his glory. I remember as a young boy, just 20, why they, the boys used to say, Billy, you don't get any pleasure out of life. You don't dance, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't go to shows or dances. What do you get out of life? And one night a young lady asked me that when I was taking her home. She said, what do you get out of life? And the next night I made an altar call in the place where I was preaching, a local Baptist church, and down the aisle come 30 or 40 people kneeling at the altar. The young lady was sitting there weeping. I said, would you stand up, sister? I said, you wanted to know where I got my pleasure? This is worth more to me than all the things that the world ever gave me. Just one thing here. It gives such a peace and a satisfaction to my soul. I am so happy tonight that Almighty God, in his infant mercy and his redeeming grace, saw fit one time to, to save me and to give me the privilege of speaking to his people. I love people. I love uh, everyone, the world, whether they're sinners or Christians. I, I feel that in my heart. Every one of us, Jesus died for all of us. I see the man sometimes out on the street drinking, and I see him gambling, and, I, but, and some of them cursing, and so that doesn't turn me against the person. It just only makes me know that Satan is doing that. That's my brother, and it, it, it just hurts me to see Satan having grip like that. Now, if I can say something to him to win him over to our Lord Jesus, where he can have eternal life, why, well, he'll stop that. He, he is my brother. He's just fallen, and I love to help him up. And that's truly from my heart. And if I should die tonight, if the testimony that I have given, which has now went around the world, and I, if I should die tonight, and this would be my last sermon that I'd ever speak or last prayer line I'd ever pray for the sake, my testimony is truth. And if I meet you to judgment, you'll find out that I have only testified what is the truth of Jesus Christ and his mercy. Some time ago, just in this little testimony, I was at Houston, Texas, and I was having a meeting. We were having somewhat about 8,000 in, in a coliseum, and Mr. Bosworth and I was together, my brother here. We were having a lovely meeting, Raymond Ritchie and many of the uh, churches around were sponsoring the meeting. And there came a man. I have plenty of critics. We know that. We are bound to. If Jesus had them, well, I've got to have them too, and so have you. We all have them. But uh, there was a man uh, uh, just out of the seminary, and he was a very smart, brilliant man. He was a, a doctor, had just got his degree, and he was uh, a Baptist minister. His name was Dr. Beth. And he was a very brilliant young man. He had a, a nice tabernacle there and a very fine following. And uh, some of these people were coming over to the meeting, and so he took the, the side to say that there was no such a thing as divine healing. Well, Mr. Bosworth and fixing the itinerary and the advertisement and, and Mr. Ritchie and many of the other ministers had hung a sign out in the street that miracles ever night. Well, Mr. Best said, well, that was ridiculous and there was no such a thing as divine healing. And he, and he put a challenge in the paper instead of coming to us. He put a challenge in the paper and said, uh, William Branham is uh, a religious imposter and said he should be run out of the city and I should be the man to do it. <laughs> so I didn't think it sounded very Christian in my brother, but that was all right. And Mr. Bosworth came and he said, Brother Branham, look at this. And he, he challenged me to debate the subject of divine healing with him openly before the people. Well, I'm not a debater. I don't believe in fussing. I, I preach the gospel. If the people believe it, well, all right. If they don't, that's all I can do about it. And uh, I, you never make anything by fussing and debating. Don't never do it because you just make enemies. That's all. I've seen too much of it. So Mr. Bosworth, he came and he said, uh, Brother Ben, look at this. I said, Brother Bosworth, just let it alone. I said, we've got thousands of people to be prayed for. And why would we fool with one person who doesn't believe when there's thousands waiting to be prayed for who does believe? I said, why well, fool with it? Well, the next day, the minister put in the paper a great headline in the Houston Chronicle, and he said, it goes to show what they're made out of. They're ashamed and afraid when the real gospel is laid out before them to debate the subject, because it shows what they're made out of. 
Well, here come Brother Bob, which you know him again. He said, look at here, Brother Branham. Are you going to take that? And I said, why, Brother Bosworth, it won't do any good. I said, I, the Holy Spirit is with me. He promised me he would do. And, and I'm, I have the anointing to pray for sick people, and I just won't fool it. He said, let me do it. And so let me, he said, it's a shame to the public will think that we're just a bunch of people just, just uh, flying about, that there's no scripture to it or nothing, that we owe it to the public. I said, I only owe the public what God told me to do. And he said, well, Brother Branham, he said, it's not right. So that man hasn't got, that I can produce hundreds of scriptures. And, I, and they haven't even got, that man hasn't got one, one scripture in the Bible to stand on. And said, let me prove it. Well, I thought of Caleb, you know, when he, that old fellow that had the sword, he said, Joshua, he put this in my hand when I was 40 years old and said, I'm 80 today. I'm just as good a man today as I was when Joshua gave me the sword. Well, I thought that was pretty gallant of him, being in his 70s, and Mr. Best in his 30s. I thought, just fresh out of the seminary. I looked at him, and I said, Brother Bosworth, I don't want you to go down there and fuss with that man. He said, Brother Branham, I wouldn't fuss with nobody. He said, I wouldn't do it, but I know one thing. I know what the Word of God teaches. <laughs> he said, I think you owe it to say something about it. I said, all right, you go do it. And, but you promise me you won't fuss. He said, I promise. Well, like a little child with Christmas anticipations, down the steps he went. The reporters are waiting. They wouldn't let him come to the room up there. And, I, and so I said, uh, I wouldn't fuss with him. So Brother Bosworth, he went down. And then, of course, you know how the newspaper can write. Very big headline, Ecclesiastical Fur Will Fly. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> they really decorated it up real good. So they, the next day, but here's what made me know that someday, the great church of God is coming together. Just as sure, you're going to forget your, di your differences. When communism goes to forcing you right hard, don't worry. You'll come together. <laughs> God has a way of doing things. And so when the great press come on, it was strange. We couldn't stay in that Coliseum anymore. We, had to, we couldn't stay in that place we were at. We had to go over and rent the big San Houston Coliseum, seats around 30,000. And that day, they come in by special planes, special trains, and so that place packed completely full of people. They didn't care whether they were Methodist, Baptist, whether they were Pentecostal, oneness, twoness, threeness, or Church of God, or whether it was riding a one-hump camel, two-hump camel, or whatever it was, there was one thing in common, and that was divine healing was at stake, and every man believed in it, and here he come to take the part of it. That's what it takes. Wait till Christianity comes to that spot, and you'll find all the Methodists and Baptists and all of them looking just alike, man. Everybody coming right together, pressing into the kingdom of God. And I, I just, that settled it with me that day. When I looked back there, and there was thousands of all different descriptions of people sitting there from all kinds of churches, Catholic and all, everybody placed together. And so I told Brother Bosworth, I wouldn't go down that night. I said, no, I don't want to hear it. I, he, and my brother was with me, and my wife and a little girl. He said, uh, well, you just stay at the hotel. I was staying at that time at the Rice Hotel. So I went to the, when it got time to go, I, I just couldn't hardly stay away. So I, I got in the cab, and the couple of police come. And so they take me down, and I pull my overcoat up like this, and we went way up in balcony 30, and I got a seat up there just before all the crowds got packed in. I was sitting there with my coat up, my wife and boys sitting there. Well, when they come up for the discussion, the moderators and so forth come to the platform. Mr. Cy Ramsar, who used to be Paul Rader's song leader, was leading songs for us, and he was singing very much as a diplomat on the platform. He was leading his singing. And just before he turned the service over to the moderator, he said, I was reading in the paper the other day where that someone said that William Branham ought to be run out of the city, a religious imposter said, if you people of Houston had put more time running bootleggers out of the city and you would be a religious man like that, said your city would be better off. And a great roar went up all through this place. So I thought, well. And I looked at Brother Bosworth. I'm not saying it's because he's sitting behind me and I believe his wife and son and daughter-in-law and I'm sitting present somewhere here tonight. I'm not saying this, but I admired him. And he walked out. Mr. Beth, when he came over, he went and hired uh, photographers to come take his picture. And he wanted to take his picture. He said, I'm going to skin that old man and take the hide off of him and tack it on my study door for a memorial to divine healing. 
had a statement for a child of God to say, you know, but so they, he said that. And so he wanted to take the picture. So they hired the Douglas Studios in Houston, Texas to come take his picture. And so uh, Mr. Bosworth, who had never been in a debate before, and so uh, he wanted Mr. Bosworth. He, Mr. Bosworth thought he would just stand and give scriptures and discuss them. So Mr. Bosworth had a great load of scriptures wrote out. He said, Mr. Best, if, and Mr. Best said, no, you go ahead and say what you're going to say in 30 minutes, but I'll say what I got to say in 30 minutes. So, well, they agreed on that and had a puddle like at the last. Well, I was sitting listening, wondering what was going to take place. Well, when I seen my brother Bob was walk out there coolly, know just where he was at, there's no doubt in his mind, he said, Dr. Best, he said, we are sorry that we have to have discussions like this, but said, uh, you had a statement in the paper that Brother Branham was a religious imposter and there was no such a thing as divine healing. So now our subject tonight to discuss is not Brother Branham. It's whether divine healing is in the Bible or not. That's what you, the debate's for. That's what it's signed up for. Whether divine healing was taught in the scriptures. He said, the gifts of God will prove themselves. But this is what we're teaching, whether divine healing is in the Bible or not. He said, I'll have, I forget how many scriptures there, a hundred or two. He said, this is Christ's present, his attitude, present attitude towards the sick is just the same today as it ever was. So many scriptures he had, said, if you'll take one of those scriptures and by the scripture disprove it, then we won't have any discussion. I've lost the debate, and I'll sit down. If you can take the scriptures and prove that Christ's present attitude isn't just exactly the same towards the sick now as it ever was. And uh, he offered him the paper. Mr. Bell said, I'll take care of that when I get up there. He said, you go ahead and what you're going to say. So I'll take care of that. And Mr. Bosworth said, then Mr. Bell, I'll ask you one question. And if you will answer me yes or no, I'll sit down. He said, was the redemptive names of Jehovah applied to Jesus, yes or no? I never thought of that in a cell. That settled it. That's all. He said, I'll answer that. He said, I'm asking you to answer me now. He said, we won't have to discuss it. You say yes or no. Of course, he couldn't. Certainly not. If the, if the redemptive things of Jehovah was not applied to Jesus, he was not the Christ or the Son of God. He wasn't Jehovah Jireh, the Lord's provided sacrifice. And if he was the Lord's provided sacrifice, Jehovah Jireh, he was also Jehovah Rapha, the healer, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That settled it, see. So Mr. Best got up and turned around, kind of shook his fist two or three times and sat down. And so Mr. Bosworth stood there and just laid off scripture. And I never heard it like that in my life, just as coolly, and placed everything to a place where Mr. Best didn't even have one place at all to go to in scripture. He just was just tied so perfectly, so there was no angle to get out of it. He was just tied down. Mr. Best got up. When his time come, and Mr. Bosworth, with a very, very polite way, said, Mr. Vest, all right, my brother, uh, the platform's yours now, the moderator giving the platform. Mr. Vest got up there and laughed two or three times and preached a very good Camelot sermon. <laughs> I'm a Baptist. I know what Baptist doctrine is. <laughs> so he preached a Camelot sermon on the resurrection. He didn't even believe the miracles that Jesus Christ did. Lazarus died again. He preached it all in the resurrection, and this mortal puts on immortality. Of course, any Christian believes that. There'd be a resurrection, but if there's no attributes of the resurrection, if there's no earnest of the resurrection, then there is no resurrection. If there is no divine healing, then there is no resurrection. Now, you couldn't disprove that if you could, but the scripture. See, I'm already in the points of Christ. See, because we have the earnest of our salvation, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is that right? That's the down payment, the earnest which holds it secure in heaven for us. And then if there is no divine healing, to make a cancer-ridden body come normal and well again, there is no resurrection of the dead. In fact, we have no earnest of it at all. There's no plan made for it. So that's settled. Mr. Best commenced the going on, and, and the audience actually laughed at him. And um, so um, he said, uh, let me see that divine healer come forth and perform. And he got real angry. And he said, let me see that divine healer come forth and perform. Mr. Bosworth said the very idea, Mr. Best. You call him Brother Branham a divine healer. I said, 
and never is all his life did he ever claim to be a divine healer. Very much contrary. He only preaches divine healing through the atonement, just exactly what I proved to you. And you've never even mentioned one scripture that I said or come to any of it. You've never done nothing to preach on the resurrection of the dead, and we all believe that. So <laughs> there it was. It's up to the audience to make their choice. He said, let me see that divine healer. He said, Brother Branham wants to be brought in this. The subject is where divine healing is taught in the Bible, and you can't say one word against it. See? Because if you can't say it now, so there wasn't nothing to be said, because there wasn't no way he could go, because it was all covered over with the atonement and everything. So there it was. There wasn't nothing to be said. He said, let me see that divine healer. And Mr. Bosworth said to him, said, Brother Beth, do you believe that God saves a soul? He said, yes. You teach that through the atonement? He said, yes. He said, would you want to be called a divine savior? That if Brother Branham, by preaching divine healing, is a divine healer, then if you preach salvation, you're a divine savior. Mm -hmm. So, oh, he got really on the air then. <laughs> and so he began to roll up and down and said, There's nothing in the world decent, in a, a decent thinking people don't believe in such nonsense. He said, Baptists don't believe in no such a thing. He said, Well, beg your pardon. Brother Bosworth said, Brother Branham is rocked in a Baptist cradle. <laughs> So that's right. But all he says he's a backslidden type. <laughs> backslidden type. He said, there's no such, said, real, true, honest, bad, just don't believe in no such. But the bachelor said, would you excuse me just a moment? He said, how many sitting in this vast audience that belongs to these fine Baptist churches with all these Baptist ministers sitting along here? He said, how many of you in this audience could prove by a doctor's statement that you've been healed by divine healing, the power of God, in Brother Branham's meeting, these last few weeks, and 300 stood up. <laughs> so what about those? Mr. Best hit the pulpit with his face and said, People can say anything, but that doesn't make it right. I said, Here's the word teaches it, and there's the testimony of it. Now what about it? And he said, said Let me see that divine healer. Then Mr. Ritchie got up. He said, Just ask the moderator if he could speak just a moment. He said, I know every one of these Baptist ministers. He said, Is this the attitude of the Southern Baptist Convention towards divine healing? 30,000 people. <laughs> Is this the attitude that the Southern Baptist Convention takes towards uh, a divine healing? Nobody would answer. He said, I'm asking you, brethren, did you all send this man here, or did he come on his own? They said he'd come on his own. I thought so. Baptists believe in divine healing. Certainly they did. And so, I, and so he said he'd come on his own. So that settled it with the Baptist, Southern Baptist Church. It was Mr. Best, his own self. So then he kept saying, if I see that uh, miracle worker, let me see him come out here and let me see him hypnotize one of these people and let me see him a year from now and see if he's still hypnotized and all like that, you know, just going on. So he said, come up here, won't you take my picture? And he stood there, that man, he put his finger under that saintly old man's face. He said, now I'll take it, with his fingers shaking. They took the picture and he drawed his fist and shook it under his nose, you know. He said, now, now I'll take it. And they took his picture like that. So they took six, nine to ten glasses of him like that. They went back. They said to look, life, time, Collier, and all those, and the Chronicle, and all those magazines and papers sitting there. And then Brother Bosworth said, well, now the meeting, as far as I'm concerned, is, is finished. He said, Mr. Best cannot answer one question against divine healing. Besides, he's miserably whipped. But how many things, folks, say amen, and just one great scream went over the building. And then he got real angry and walked around and slapped the minister just about halfway across that platform. And then they had to separate him. <laughs> So then he walked back and said, bring me that divine healer. Brother Bosworth said, now, Brother Branham is sitting in the meeting. I know he's here because he's seen me up there. He said, now, if he wants to come and dismiss the audience, all right. But said, under such a fuss as this, of course, no. He said, he pray for the sick. He said, if you want to see healings done, come over tomorrow night. They'll be going along all along. And said, I know he's in the meeting. Well, I sit and still. My brother's sitting there. He said, now, you sit still. You said you would. And I said, well, I'm sitting still. So he, he said, and you and while I was sitting there like that, I heard something going. I knew it was me. I raised up. My brother said, sit down. My wife said, no. I looked, see, and there it was. So just then everybody's looking around. They didn't know one who was up there. And there were just thousands of friends there. And when I looked back, people just without one big scream. Poor, dear, loving people. they have seen so many things done that week. So several ushers, hundreds of them, hauled their arms together like that and made a line. The people trying to touch your clothes to the people. Brother, this is not something easy. I'm human. I've got children at home. And mother's trying to push their little kids through that rusher's arms to touch their clothes when you're passing by. 
God will reward you for that. He will. Sure. And I walked down the platform. I said, Brother Dad. He said, As a man, I admire you. And you're a doctor and you're wrong. I said, That's mutually felt. <laughs> and I said, I admire you, Brother Dad. And you've got a right for your, for your ideas. I said, That's why we're fighting over here in Korea. It's the boys. It's to keep this America. Every man to his own opinion. I said, I don't want any of this people, or any Brother Bestest people, or any of the Baptist people, anyone, to feel bad towards Brother Dad. I said, Don't do that. He's our brother, and he just doesn't see it like that. He, he just believes it his way, and he's got a right to believe it his way. I said, remember, his mother loves him just the same as my mother loves me and your mother loves you. I said, he's somebody's boy, and he's got a right to his belief, so don't feel hard at him. It's just Mr. Bosworth just proved by the word that the doctrine is sound and in the Bible, and Mr. Best could not prove it. And so uh, Mr. Best just turned around and started off the platform, and he turned back and looked and sat down. And I said, I have never said that I was a divine healer. I said, never. I said, my books are published in about 17 different languages. And I said, and I guess I'm in contact with several million people. But never have I said a divine healer. I don't heal people. I said, the only thing I do is preach divine healing by the cross and by the Bible. And I said, now when I was a little boy, I said, my mother said, a light hung over me when I was a baby. Yeah, my people were Catholic before me, and my mother and father went to no church. We were Irish on both sides, immigrants from Ireland. And so I said, we were, and there, they didn't go to church. I was born in a little mountain cabin. I said, when I was just a little bitty boy, it began to deal with me. Down through life, it always spoke. And many, many times, and thousands of people have seen it. It comes in like a light. I said, it tells me things. And when he met me, he told me that it was the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ that done just exactly the same things that Brother Bosworth never said tonight. Jesus didn't claim to do any healing. He said, what the Father shows me, I don't do nothing, I can heal nothing, but just I do just what the Father shows me by vision, that's what I do. And you know that's the truth, isn't it? Every Bible reader, scholar knows that's the truth. So he walked through the crowd, he perceived their thoughts, he knows what they're thinking about, he knows what was wrong with him, he knows the woman at the well, when he talked to her a little bit, where her trouble was, he knows the Samuel's trouble, and... and you know, where a fish had a corn in his mouth, just as God would show him, he would do. I said, he didn't claim to be a healer. And the resurrection of him, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I said, now, if I testify the truth, God will testify of me. If I do not testify the truth, God will never have nothing to do with a lie. God will always testify truth, though. And I said, I'm not out here just to be seen. I'm out here not by choice, by a long way. I wanted to be a... Well, I was a game warden in the state of Indiana. I, was, I loved my job. I was born for the wilderness and wild. Uh, certainly, it wasn't my choice to preach the gospel, but war unto me if I preach it not. It was God's choice. I run from it and try to get away from it and everything. But I said, it was him who brought it. And now, I said, if I tell the truth, God will testify the truth. And the more instead of something, went, here he comes. Sailing right down where I was. And this photographer went out and took a picture when he seen me turn white in the face. And he took a picture. I said, God has spoken. And that's all. Catholic people and all sitting there start, looked at it. Many of them begin to scream and fainting. Come right down. A pillar of fire. Who's right down to the world was that? He shot the picture, and the man, one of the men in the studio was a Jew. His name is Ted Kipperman. The other one's name is Mr. Iris. He's a Roman Catholic. And all, he just wrote an awful thing in the paper about me the other day, the day before that. He said, I was a hypnotizer, and I don't know what all. And so on the road home that night, taking the, the negatives, going in to have them develop for Mr. Best, he said, I might, might have been wrong. So what do you think about that, Ted? Ted said, well, I'm Jew. I don't know anything about it. He said, well, he said, I'm Catholic. I said, we were taught that those things can happen, but it can only happen in the Catholic Church. Now, you're wrong there. See? It can happen wherever God wants it to happen, whether it's in Catholic Church or uh, anywhere he wants it to happen. He's God. He does the choice. He keeps the book. And so he went in, and he put the, the pictures in the dark room to go through the assets to be developed. And the next, oh, after a bit, why, Mr. Kipperman, he said, I'm going up and lie down a little while. And so he went upstairs to lie down. And while he was up there, 
Mr. Iris smoked a cigarette or two. He went in the dark room and said, I'll see. We had to get the pictures ready because Mr. Uh, Mr. Best, Dr. Best, the minister, wanted his pictures the next day so he could show it to the people. He's shaking his fist under his nose. So then when he, the next one, Mr. Iris went in, which is an arch enemy of mine, and Brother Bowser too, he didn't believe it. He wrote a piece of paper and said, I wasn't nothing but a hypnotizer. And a garter had left a woman's throat. He said he hypnotized that off of her throat. <laughs> oh, my. That shows mental weakness. So then when he pulled the first picture out of Mr. Beth, it was Mr. Bosworth. It was negative. God wouldn't permit that taken against that saintly old man. He pulled out the next one, negative. He pulled out all six of them, and every one of them was blank. And when he pulled out the other one, there was the angel of God on the picture. He had a heart attack. They sent for him at the Rice Hotel. But, of course, there's two men stand at the door in big meetings where you have thousands and thousands of people. If someone stands at the door, they wouldn't let them in. All right. And then that night at 11 o'clock, that was sent to Washington, D.C. to be copyrighted. On the following day, it was flown back again, and they called in George J. Lacey. He's the head of the FBI in fingerprint and document, the best there is in the world. Best in the United States. So being American, we'd say he was the best in the world to us. And so he's the head of the FBI on it. And they brought him in, and he took it to the Shell building under examination of ultra-ray lights and so forth, everything he tried. He went out and he measured the distance. He took the camera to see if there's a double exposure. And he, he'd done everything that he could do to find it out. And on the, about the fourth day, he said, just go to meet the Shell building and give the announce what it was. So that day, he said, whose name's Brandon? I said, mine, a bunch of sitting there, a lot of the newspapers and things, going to see what his report was. He said, stand up. I stood up. He said, you're going to pass out of this life someday like all mortals, Reverend Branham. I said, I'm aware of that. But thank God, I said, Jesus Christ has saved me from sin. He said, I've been one of your critics. And so the man, when he brought up there, he said, Reverend Branham, it's always been said that that was psychology. But I've heard of your meetings and said that it was psychology. There wasn't nothing to it. It was just imagination. When that light would come in, everybody would say, there it is, there it is. And, and people would say, well, that's, everybody just imagined it. It was tough once before by a newspaper, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't real. They wouldn't let it go because it wasn't by the American Photographer Association. It wasn't a member of it, so they wouldn't pass it. But this was strictly the American Photographer Association. He said, Reverend Graham, I have said it was psychology, but the mechanical eye of this camera will not take psychology. So the light stuck the lens. Everybody begins crying. So he called me forward to present the picture to me, and I said, well, it's not mine. It belongs to them. He said, do you know that's worth $100,000? I said, brother, do you mean to tell me just what he got through saying? that the first time in all the world's history that a supernatural being was ever photographed. And here's what he said. So the old hypocrite, he meant the unbeliever. The old unbeliever has always said that there was no scientific way to prove a supernatural being. He said, now he can't say that no more. There is absolutely scientific proof that there is a supernatural being. See? But scientifically proved by this mechanical camera here that took the, the light of that angel standing there and said, it absolutely is the truth. And I said, well, if Jesus Christ thought enough of me to come down and have his picture taken by me for the first time in all the world, you think I'm little enough to commercialize his picture? And he said, no, I wouldn't think that. I said, I turned over to the Douglas Studios. He said, well, there ought to be some kind of agreement. I said, sure, they can sell it. And I said, they can as long as you keep it cheap enough that poor people can get it. He said, someday, Reverend Brown, you may be dead and gone. It said, you'll be sold in 10 cent stores. And I, I said, well, for the glory of God, that would be fine. So then, tonight, the picture's here. George J. Lacey is living today. He's still in this work. And the picture lives on. And if, if I would die this night, what I have testified about, the scientific world can't say it isn't so because there's scientific machinery and proof that I've told the truth. And the church of millions of people that's been preached to in the past few years has seen it and watched it. And you know it yourself that I've told the truth. And God's testified that it is the truth. That's right. So the testimony is absolutely true. Now look, Christian friends, you're looking for something way out yonder to come. You're looking for something way back this way. Don't do that. It's right here now. Right here now. Just as much as you'll ever see. See, only might sit in greater quantity. But the Holy Spirit is here now, which is the Lord Jesus Christ in his resurrection. 
so marvelous. I remember something else happened there when Brother Bosworth came into the room the next day, and he had a picture of Florence Nightingale. How many of you ever heard of Florence Nightingale? Sure, she's founder of the Red Cross. Her granddaughter from London, England, she's under the British crown in a Durban, South Africa, dying, which she didn't know about, with cancer on the, the duodal cancer in her bowels. They showed me her picture, and Brother Bosworth, I and my wife all wept when we seen it. She was next to the smallest woman I ever seen in my life eat up. Her limbs up here around the, uh, the thigh wasn't over about that big around. And her, she, now, Georgia Carter of Milltown, Indiana, which had been laying on her back nine years and eight months, was he with TB by vision and didn't even know where the place was. Went down there, and there she was, just as he said. She's my piano player in the Milltown Baptist Church where I'm still pastor down there. I have an associate tonight. She's a piano player there and been on her bed for nine years and eight months and never moved from the bed. But, and, but she only weighed 35 pounds, approximately. But TB had eat her up. But now, now that's not my statement. That's doctor's statement. And any of these things are absolutely doctor's statements. If they cannot back up with the doctor, they have to be proven. And not by ministers, not by, they have to be proven by doctors before we can put them because they have to be uh, that way. And now, she, uh, she was healed. And Florence Nightingale, a very lovely woman, they wanted to send a, they had two airplane tickets that had already come in for me to come to Durban, Africa. I laid it on the floor, and Brother Bosworth and I prayed. I said, Lord, if you'll heal this woman, I'll go to Africa. I can't go now, looky here. So I just committed to the Lord, sent a handkerchief back to her, and went on. Not long after that, King George of England, when a man by the name of I forget, at Fort Wayne, you remember the meeting, and Fort Wayne Gospel Tabernacle was, had, is a businessman of the city. He had multiple cirrhosis and had been a bed patient 10 years. And a patient come over to the man, and he was made perfectly whole. Walked, Lehman was his name. Walked up, and he was a friend to the king's private secretary. And through there, King George of England sent word to me, I have his statements and I have his letters with his seals and to come pray for him with multiple cirrhosis. And so I couldn't go at that time, so I just wired back and told the king that I would pray for him here, that God would hear here just the same as he would over there. And so then another telegram comes to and wanted me to come on over immediately. Later, when I went to England, over there, to, to see him, uh, the Lord healed him. He was put me stand up over five minutes at a time, and he, I believe the second day he played 18 holes of golf and never was bothered with it no more until the very day he died, and I was in Africa when he died. They found a little tumor here on his lung and started to cut it open, and air got to it some way. I don't know, and caused a blood clot to go to his brain and kill him instantly. So, very fine man. But when we landed in, in England at the International Airport, thousands of people, of course, had packed in. And they kept paging in there, and Brother Baxter, one of the managers, went in to find out what, was, what they wanted. And it was a man said, the plane... Florence Nightingale is laying in a plane dying. How she know I was there? I don't know. But she'd come from Africa, flown in there, and was laying dying out in the next plane. And so the, the minister said, could one know if I could go to her. Why, there was just packed and jammed in there, certainly. I, oh, I couldn't have got through there if I had to. And I said, no, I couldn't go right now. I said, you take her to your house, and I'm going over to Piccadilly Hotel, then down to Buckingham Palace, out to Westminster Abbey, then I'll be right back in the Piccadilly Hotel, and you take her to your parsonage, is an Anglican minister. I said, then I'll go over and pray with her. He said, Brother Branham, she won't live. I said, well, I can't get to her there, sir. You know what it'd be if I get out of this line here, what it would be. He said, well, all right, I'll try. So he said, they think she's dying. They can't see any life in her now. And so I said, well, you take her on then, and we, we'll see, because I can't get there. Well, I went on, went on down. King wasn't in at the time. I come back over to Westminster Abbey and a great group of ministers, you know, and all that night they never got me back to the hotel until about, oh, 2 o'clock in the morning. And about, then the next morning early, was anybody here over in England? It's around in April. It's so foggy. Oh, my. You can hardly see your hand before you. A little bitty car drove up, and they come and got me. Went out to this minister's to the rectory. And when I went upstairs... Some of the managers, Mr. Gordon Lindsay, you know, the writer of the Voice of Healing, Mr. Baxter, and all many of the managers, we went up to the room. And when I went in there, there sat her doctor, two nurses, and two or three ministers. We entered the room, and we were very, had a very fine welcome by the people. 
And so I walked over to see Mrs. Nightingale. Now, she hadn't eaten a bite. That would have been, I guess, two months before that or more. I hadn't missed your Bible. Now, she hadn't eaten a bite since then, and her limbs then were just about like that. And her legs were all blue where the uh, veins had collapsed. And it was a terrible-looking sight. So I looked at her, and I seen her face how thin and all eaten away. And I said, uh, her doctor there, I said, any chance for her? I said, not a chance. I said, oh, my, it's too bad. I walked over. I said, how do you do, Mrs. Nightingale? She couldn't speak. She was moving her lips, but she didn't have strength enough I could hear her. The nurse got down, and she said, she wants to shake your hand, Brother Branham, the nurse said. said, of course, her grandmother being the sign of the Red Cross, you can imagine what she had, the best that could be gotten. So when they brought that woman's hand out from under that sheet, it's just like taking a hold of that. I've never seen, I thought the hold of her hand is just like a skeleton. The bones is already just come the skin tight, not a bit of flesh of no. And her face here was just like square in her jaw, or and you can see her teeth here, the shape of her teeth to her jaw, her her cheeks here. Her teeth were shaped into her cheeks, like that when she go to open her mouth. I never seen anything like it alive. I said, how's she living? They didn't know. And um, so she was crying. And the nurse got down again. She said, they want you to see her body. She wants you to see her body. Well, now, I've got a mixed audience. Now, I'm your brother. But when they taken the sheet off of her body, it would break the heart of an iron man. As the lady is, her bosom burst had dropped plumb through the ribs. And in the hip here, the flesh had just about sticking through the ring. Her legs here up here was about that big around. Uh, her stomach parting here was just about like that. How that woman was living, I, I can't tell you. She couldn't move, couldn't move a finger or nothing. And she was weeping. And the nurse got down and she said, Reverend Graham, she wants you to pray to God to have God to let her die. She can't die. And I said, oh, my. Brother Lindsay turned away and many of them started weeping, walking away. They walked over there to where the doctor was standing. I stood there a little bit. And the other nurse said, Reverend Bam said, she sure has had lots of faith in you. Said she's read your book, and she said when she was in Africa, if she could ever get where you were, that God would heal her. Oh, such faith. I said, can we pray? We knelt down. I don't know how you're going to believe this, but God knows what's true. And we were all going to meet at the judgment seat. Now, knelt. Like this, and the ministers and all of them knelt around, doctor also, and the nurses. And there was a window about this high. And I knelt down beside of that window, and the window was up. And I started prayer, Almighty God, creator of heavens and earth. I couldn't ask him to let her die. After her having that much faith. And I said, have mercy upon her, God. I pray that you will. And just as I started saying, Almighty God, creator of heavens and earth, down through them bushes come a little dove. And it flew and sat on this window, not over that far from where I was praying. And it kept looking over at me, going, coo, coo, coo. Well, the minister stopped praying. They started watching the dove and all the rest of them. Well, I thought it was just a, I've never been in England before. I thought it was a pet or something. So I just kept on uh, praying. And when I said, amen, and raised up, the little fellow flew back out through the bushes again. Lay, had his little head over, going, coo, coo, coo. Just restless, walking back and forth up and down the, the cell. And I raised up, and I heard him begin to say, Did you notice that dove? Did you notice that dove? And I started to say, I said, We're going to say, Yes, I noticed the dove. Was it a pet? And as I started to say that, something caught me and said, Thus saith the Lord, she'll live and not die. She weighs about 150 pounds now in perfect health, normally and well as she can be. See? What was it? Did I heal the woman? No, no. I had nothing to do with it. God did that. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. The grace that taught my heart to fear is grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. I love him. I declare to you, my little audience tonight, that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And it's not, as people try to say, that all of his power was taken away from him and it was just lauded to disciples. He said, go into all the world. I'll be with you even to the end of the world. 
and these signs shall follow them that believe to the end of the world. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. He's here. His love is for you to save you. His power is here to heal you. The only thing that you have to do is to believe him. Will you do that tonight while I pray for your people? God bless you while we bow our heads. Loving Father, as I think tonight of a cruel, indifferent world towards your beloved Son, as I think of how that man spurned his love, just as he did that day, and desired a murder instead. How can your grace dip down yet and save people beyond anything that we know of? We're so happy that you do it. We confess our sins and we're our unworthiness, Lord, to even speak your name. Thou wonderful, loving, holy God. And we're so thankful that Jesus came to us in such a dark hour for us and has redeemed us now back to thee, and now we're thy sons and daughters. How the world tonight, how Satan has blinded the eyes of people, how they don't see that, how they don't believe it. How can they reject that, Father, knowing that you created even the trees, the heavens, the earth, the solar system, the whole heavens and earth you made and you spoke it into existence. And then to know that that same God has loved us enough to give us birth to become his sons and daughters and given us equal rights with Jesus Christ as his brother in glory. Join heirs with him in the kingdom. How we thank thee. And now, Father, there's many of your children out in sin tonight. I pray for each one. Don't let them be lost, Lord. Do something. I think about our lovely, beautiful America here. I think about Florida, oh, so far away from God, down here in this beautiful country where people have their minds on property and things of this world, and pleasures, gone pleasure mad, races, drinking and gambling and devices, and they're your poor children, Father. Satan has did this. Don't hold it against them, I pray you won't, God. But I pray that you'll do something that'll save every one of them. Grant it, Lord. Now tonight, this is the little audience that you gave me to preach to and to pray for, and I'm thankful. And God, I pray that every one that has come here tonight, well, not one of them will be lost, but everyone will be there at that day. And, oh, holy God, divine Father, when I come at that day, may my testimony ring just as true then as it is now. Thou knowest my heart, and I'm so thankful that you vindicated it to be the truth, not because your servant has said it, but because by divine grace you have done it, and I'm so grateful. Now I pray that you'll heal every person here that's sick tonight, every person that's needy of anything, may they go out of here happy and healthy, and on the road home may they stay like those who come from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us, because they had found that Jesus had risen from the dead. May they find it tonight here, Lord, in West Palm Beach, that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, living in his people, doing the same things he did when he was here on earth. And your great pillar of fire, which was your spirit that followed Israel, has come to us. We see it. We know it's here. It speaks for itself. And the scientific world has caught a picture of it. We're happy for that. And now, Lord Jesus, may he confirm his word tonight. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Fine province of God, you might disagree with me, which I know I could call you right now, many of you doing it, but, but don't stop it from being true. I pray that God will do something tonight that will make you a believer, that will make you understand it. May the Lord bless you. His presence is here. What if Jesus has risen from the dead? As Christians, we ought to believe that. That's the very basic principle. All of his teaching, all of his works, all of his miracles died with him if he didn't raise from the dead. But if he's risen from the dead, Dr. Reed had, how many ever heard of him? Sure you have. He's a great man, the president or something of the Sudan mission. He stood to me not long ago before he received the Holy Spirit. 
said, Brother Branham, talking to a staunch Mohammed, he said, why don't you renounce your dead prophet and accept the resurrected Lord? And said the Mohammed said, kind sir, what can your resurrected Lord do any more for me than what my dead prophet can? said, my dead prophet promised life after death, and said, so did your Lord. He said, they both wrote books, we believe them. Well, uh, Dr. Reedhead said, we have happy and joy. He said, so do we. Any psychologist knows that. He said, we have happy and joy by believing it. He said, so do we. But we have the proof of it. He said, how do you prove it? Any more than we can. He said, well, it changes as it makes Christians say, so does it make Mohammed. He said, kind sir, our Mohammed never promised like your Lord did. Our Mohammed is dead and in the grave, and we got a white horse stand there year after year. Someday he'll rise. But said, you claim that your Jesus rose from the dead. And said, your Jesus promised you that if he, after he was risen from the dead, that he'd be with you, and the very things that he did, you'd do also. So now let me see you teachers produce that, and we'll believe your Lord Jesus raised from the dead. But said, let, said, let our Mohammed raise from the dead, and the whole world will know it. Dr. Reed had said he changed the subject. He had to. There was nothing he could do. He was whipped standing right in the ground. Yes, sir. He said, Brother Branham, I thought of you. He said, if I could ever get to where you are. And he come there and said, has the teachers been wrong? I said, with reverence, I say yes, Brother Reed had. He said, I've seen Pentecostalism, I've seen all the holy rollers and all that kind of stuff. He said, I've been taught in degrees and everything else. He said, Brother Ben, I'm asking you, I know you're fundamentalist yourself, but I'm asking you, is the baptism of the Holy Ghost truth? I said, it is, Dr. Reedhead. God is my judge. The same Holy Ghost that fell on Pentecost is the same for Jesus today and in the full same kind of power. He said, can I receive it? I said, yes, sir. He said, when? I said, right now. He said, how do I get it? I said, by laying on a hand. Prayed for him, laid hands on him, stopped giving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then come Dr. Lee, come the rest of them, Don Wells, and the Archbishop from India. The Archbishop come over here investigating around and has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Archbishop of India, Presbyterian Archbishop, friends, you people will see someday that the very chief cornerstone has been rejected by the builders. Right. Jesus has risen from the dead. And if he's here tonight, he can do just the same with his people. Now, he can't let you believe. A minister said to me, said, Brother Bram, I don't care what would take place. I wouldn't believe it. I said, it's not for unbelievers. It's for believers. They didn't believe Jesus. And they surely won't believe his servants. <laughs> I said, it's just for those two, but these signs shall follow them that believe, not unbelievers, believers. May the Lord bless you. We give our prayer cards to you. What was the letter? E. This is our third, third night, isn't it? Third time. I think the first we called from the first part, second part. Let's begin tonight with E50. Who has E50? Raise up your hand. E50, 51. 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60. They stand, if you'll stand in line over here, pardon me. How many is that? That's 10. I've been calling 15 in the town now. All right. 65, from 60 to 65 in E. Stand next, if you can. If you can't, raise up your hand. If you're crippled and can't stand, got those cards, raise up your hand. Somebody will come help you. Now, let them count and see if they're, if they're there. If they're not some deaf person, look on your neighbor's card. He may be deaf and can't hear. You see, he won't know his number's called. Would you do it? I want you to be reverent, just as reverent as you can be. I was looking for one of those pictures. I don't know. I was going to show you one of those pictures. They're here. But we do not let them go on Sunday. We don't. We keep God, God of holy in the way of not buying or selling. I'm not a Sabbatarian, but I'm, I just keep that day that way. I've always done it. And we buy the pictures ourselves and give them to the people. Absolutely. It costs what it costs us to get them. 
We don't. We have books, but that's not my book. I buy them books from another man. See? I buy books at forty percent off. Pay postage on them, ship them to me, put them in my truck. Call somebody to drive it and send them to a meeting. How much you make off of them? Every meeting I go in debt with them. If I didn't think they help people, I wouldn't have them here. I think they help because testimonies comes in. And here's our brother has went and got the picture. Excuse me, just a moment, lady. Again. How many believe that it was a pillar of fire that led the children of Israel through wilderness? A pillar of fire. You know what a pillar is. How many believe that that was Jesus Christ? Let's see your hand. Every Bible scholar does. His angel of the covenant. Is he the same yesterday, today, and forever? But here's a picture of it here. Now that same being. Now, if he will come to us tonight and bless us. You will, that'll be him that talks. It won't be me. Now, you can imagine seeing that. It stands like post here, and you just, not yourself. You just become like, that electric light bulb can't say, look here, I'm giving light, say to that window. See, I'm giving light. And tomorrow, the light the window will say, see, I'm the one that's giving light. It's neither one of them giving light. This is not the light bulb giving light. It's the current in the bulb that's giving light. Is that right? It ain't the wind of giving light, it's the sun outside giving light. It just reflects the light. Is that true? Did you ever study Genesis? The beautiful Genesis, how the God made the heavens and earth, the sun and the moon. And when the sun goes down, the moon reflects the light of the sun. Is that right? It's just exactly like Christ in the church. When Christ has gone away from the earth, he shines back his power on the church, which reflects his light. See? That's just like bride and bridegroom. The whole, the whole book of Genesis, the whole Bible types out in a tie to Jesus Christ. And now, the, and Exodus, the 13th chapter, you'll see that that pillar of fire, what was called to Moses in a burning bush, George J. Lacey, read his little article on it there. He'll tell you what it is. He said it looked like an amber light through the violet rays and so forth like. It was about this wide, about that long, rather than about that wide. And thousands, times thousands and thousands of Christians have seen it. See? They come right down before 10,000 people in Jeffersville, one of us baptizing one afternoon, and told me that, uh, 11 years before I was sent out on this mission that it would take place this way. And so it would be a forerunning message like John the Baptist went as a forerunner to Jesus Christ, so would this message be the forerunning just before the coming of Jesus Christ. And now the scientific world knows it. Now, the paper here, if you like to write to Mr. Lacey, or the FBI concerning it, or whatever it is, just go ahead, you're at liberty. That's what we want you to do, and find out. We don't try to misstate anything, friends. We only tell that which is true. And may the Lord bless. Now, slowly, I want to ask this again. I'm going to ask you all to be seated, be quiet, be reverent. Now, if you want to thank the Lord for something that's been done, or praise Him, that's up to you. I want you to do that. But when the Spirit is moving... Now, do you realize, looky here, how many believe that every person is a spirit? Let's see your hand. Well, sure, you have to. You wouldn't, you'd be dead. Look, there's spirit around there, spirit here, spirit around here, everywhere, there's spirit. And here you are standing here talking to an individual, this person praying, that one praying, this and praying that. You see what I mean? Jesus, one time in a congregation like that, took a man by the hand and led him outside the city. Is that right? He went into another place where there was all crying and weeping going on. He said, give place. The girl's not dead. She's asleep. Well, they laughed at him, made fun of him. And he put them, everyone out of the house and went in and raised the girl. Is that right? So that's psychology. It is. Look at Peter when Darkus was raised. It was all weeping and crying to widows. He put them, everyone out of the house, went over and prayed, and went and laid his hands on Darkus, and she rose up. Is that right? Not psychology, friends. It's the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, let's just be reverent a few moments and kind of be in prayer. Would you give us a little card on this song, Only Believe If You Will, Sister Connor? I want everybody to be praying. Now, I, let me state this again tonight. I will not be responsible for anything that happens to critics or unbelievers from this time 
to the end of the service. I mean, you heard me say that, and I heard it clearly. That's law. I have to say that. Because it'll go right from one to another. Man come in the building just perfectly normal and well and go out with a cancer. Unbeliever. So you you have to be reverent. Uh, so everyone understands. Now don't get up and move around. You just do and whatever to you people in the prayer line. Now how many here's things about fifteen or, or, or is everybody there? All right. That's about fifteen I believe I called there in the prayer line. Wouldn't have called but two or three. But now how many out there are anywhere in the audience, anywhere, that doesn't have prayer cards and says, God, I want you to heal me tonight. Raise up your hand. Say, I want, God, I want God to heal me tonight. You don't have prayer cards, but you believe anyhow God's going to heal you. All right, that's, I ask you one thing. I ask you to believe that I've told you the truth and believe first that this is the Word of God. And this is only a confirmation of His Word. Any preaching, any teaching that's done outside this Bible is not the truth. Paul said, if an angel from heaven would come preach any other thing to you, let him be under your curse. Is that right? Well, the visitation of angels, did Paul preach that? Sure he did. He said he had an angel that followed him, stood by him, said, the angel of God, whose servant I am, stood by me last night. Then fear not, Paul. Is that right? Sure, he saw visions and everything. He was a prophet of God. Now, while we're praying, I believe this is a lady. You come here if you were lady. Now, the only reason that these people are brought here to the platform, just line up a few at a time, is this, that the Spirit of God can come, and I've been speaking, you see, and then the anointing comes, and if it's another world, God has got a tape recording, as it was, a movie of every move that you've made in your entire life. Do you believe that? And he can reveal it just as he will. Now, this woman here is a total stranger, as far as I know. I don't know one person in this building outside of Brother Bosworth, I guess, and my son standing here, and Brother sitting here, that's all I know. I don't know one of you. But God knows every one of you, doesn't he? Well, if this is the angel of the Lord, and I've told the truth, then God will speak of the truth, and he'll testify that that is the truth. Now, any man can come to you and tell you anything he wants to. That's just what the man said. You have a right to doubt that. But when God speaks and says the man told the truth, then you believe God. Is that right? Now, I want to talk to the woman just a little bit. Now, what do you think would happen if our Lord Jesus was standing here with this suit that he gave me and had this on and was standing here talking to this woman? What would he do? As far as healing her? No. If she's sick, I don't know if she's sick. But if she is sick, he couldn't heal her. He'd say, I did that when I died at Calvary. Do you believe it? But now, what did he do to the woman at the well? Let's just look at his ministry. He said, bring me a drink. wonder why. She said, my customer, if you Jews, ask us Samaritan stuff. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. Now, I'd bring you water, or give you water, you didn't come. What is he doing? He was trying to contact her spirit. She was a spiritual being, of course. And he was trying to contact her spirit. And as soon as he found her spirit, he went right straight to her trouble and told her what it was. Is that right? Now, isn't he the same Jesus tonight? I... Now, I know he should. The very picture that you've seen there, that supernatural being, isn't standing two feet from where I am right now. Now, that's true. You'll see it, judgment. I want to talk to the woman. Just a, a little word that he's all I wish to say to you. And I, it's just, I'm here to help you. And the only way I can help you is to point you to Jesus Christ. You're aware that something's going on. It's, it's his presence. That angel picture that you see, that's exactly what you're aware that's near you now. You believe that, that God in this last days has, is restoring back his church again? You believe that? Isn't he wonderful to do it? And aren't we happy to be alive tonight to see it? Our eyes are beholding things that, that the prophets desire to see just before the second coming of our Lord. Your trouble, of course, I see it. It's on your mouth. That's not a burn or a blister. It's a cancer. And the cancer is a eating cancer going into your lips. There's a hope for you, and that's in Jesus Christ. 
I bend it, I could see that. And see it's on your lips. I want you to believe me as God's prophet. Because the people out there, more you talk to anyone, more vision you'll see, of course. You just keep breaking into that dimension that they're in. And you see God reveal. But I don't try too much on one person because look at them here and around. See? And every one vision will do more to you, weakness, than preaching for five hours straight. How many know that scripture? Sure it is. Daniel saw one vision of trouble at his head for many days. But then you could see that on the woman's face there. There may be something else. She may have some other disease. If it is, God can reveal it as soon as he could that. But I want you to look at me and believe just for a few moments. Just as, as, as your brother. Yes, ma'am? You do have other things. You've got a, a, you've got a high blood pressure. Isn't that right? And you also have some kind of a coughing. It's an it's a, 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 a asthmatic condition in your throat. Is that true? And here's something else. You've got someone that you're deeply interested in, and I believe it's a boy, it's a son, and he was, I see him in a uniform, he was a soldier or something, and he's, he, he's got mentally tore up, isn't that right, the army, he, he, something happened in the army, he's mentally, is that true, sister? Come here. Merciful God, to this poor little war mother standing here. Oh, God, be merciful to her. Satan, the enemy, is trying to send her to a premature grave, if he could, brokenhearted. But thou, oh God, is full of love and compassion. And I pray with the prayer of faith, you said she'll save the sick. And I lay my hands upon her, though they're unworthy, God, for such a task. But I pray that as your servant, as a, a branch in the vine, that the healing power of Almighty God will move into this woman's body and will heal her, and may her desires be granted her tonight. For in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I rebuke the enemy of tormenting her. Amen. God bless you, sister. You believe now? It's going to be just as you have believed. God bless you. Now you may say praise be to God if you wish to. Now, only our Lord Jesus can heal the sick. God knows all things and can reveal all things, can do all things. Don't you believe that? All right. All right, lady, I want you to come. with all your heart that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is here. <clears throat> Are we strangers, my sister? You know me? You just heard of me. But I mean to know you. I don't know you. you know I was. You've only saw me in pictures. But I am... I am happy that you had faith enough in God to come to believe for healing. You believe that? And what you've read in the books and magazines and things and Reader's Digest and your colliers, you believe that was the truth? What God has said in I believe that with all my heart. Then, if you're, which I believe you're telling the truth because you're a Christian, then I I can be able to help you to receive Jesus Christ. You believe that? You, uh, you, first thing, you have a female disorder. Isn't that right? And then, say, I see something just happen to you. You had some kind of a, of attack. Just some, like a, some woman told you that that was a heart attack. And that woman herself suffered with heart trouble. It wasn't a heart attack. It wasn't. No, it's a nervous condition that you got. That's exactly. And you're going to get over it and be well. God bless you. You may go. Sister, 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 you may go.
All right, be serving in the Lord. All right. If you believe, all things are possible to them that believe, only to believers. Now, look and live, have faith in God. Now, that might not seem very much to you, but what if that was your sister? What if that was your mother, your wife, your daughter, or what if it was you? It certainly mean a lot to you, wouldn't it? Somebody's loved one, somebody who loves her just like you love yours. Now you be reverent, believe with all your heart. Do you believe, sister? You believe? Do you realize that you're standing in his presence? Not mine, I'm your brother. But his presence. Then if Jesus has risen from the dead, as we believe he has, then his life is reproduced, and as he promised the things that I do, he said, you'll do also. Do you believe that to be the truth? You must live. You realize what's wrong with you? In your stomach, cancer, drop down into the female organ. Is that right? The malignancies went down flat to the female organ. Nothing in the world can do you any good outside of God. They couldn't take your whole inside out. It's done too far gone for that. But Jesus Christ will heal you right now. Do you believe it? You want to live, don't you? Just look to him and live. You believe that God gave me the authority to pray for you and to command that to leave you? You believe it would do it? Would you live for God and give God praise if God will spare your life on this? Come here, sister. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of thy beloved child, Jesus, I have come with sincerity of heart, knowing that Satan's exposed his great trickery and powers and his lying wonders, his deceiving is exposed, and he's hid from the doctor, but he can't hide from you, God. This woman's come with sincerity. And I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that this demon called cancer leaves her body and goes out of her. And in the name of Jesus Christ, may she be healed now and be well. Amen. God bless you, my sister. Now look. This is Sunday. You're going to feel good until Wednesday. Wednesday, you're going to get extremely sick. Don't fear. Only believe. Let's say thanks be to God. How do you do, sister? You believe? You're plagued with some sort of a, a rash. You have to take treatment for it. And it breaks in your arm. You don't take the treatment, it goes all over your body. You believe Jesus will heal you tonight? Come here. Almighty God, the creator of heavens and earth, according to thy word, that says they shall lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. And this I do in the name of Jesus Christ, curse this plague on the woman. May it leave her in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, sisters. Go rejoice and be happy. Don't doubt nothing. Just believe with all your heart. Are you believing out there everywhere? If you have faith, you can have just what you ask for. If you believe, for all things are possible for them that believe. Keep praying and believing with all your heart. You will receive what you've asked for. 
any of you at any place can receive your blessing. You don't have to be up here. Just have faith and step. Ask some of them who's been healed. See what happens. God cannot fail. He cannot, cannot fail and be God. God makes the sick to be well. There's something wrong with your back, don't you, sister? Your stomach. Your eyes are going bad. But Jesus healed you when you raised your hands a few minutes ago. You are healed now in the name of the Lord Jesus. The little woman's face made her completely whole while she was sitting there a praying, believing with all of her heart. God healed her. That's the way to do it. Got a colon trouble, have you, lady? Yes. You believe God will make you well? I say you stand up, he has made you well. God bless you. Your sister wasn't exactly a colon trouble. It's in your bowels, and you have bronchitis also bothers you. Isn't that right? You're both healed, because God struck you also. Just have faith in God. There's the Holy Spirit moving right over those people right now. I see standing before me a young woman. She's wearing glasses. She's back in her middle age, I guess she'd be. I see she's got something around her arm. A doctor, a middle-aged man, pumping on something. It's blood pressure. It's low. Well, that's a woman sitting there with a brown coat on. You have raised your hand, lady. You have low blood pressure, or you did have low blood pressure. Your faith has saved you. God bless you. Go and God's peace be with you. Come, sir. You believe in? With all your heart, be reverent. God's eternal power and Godhead is moving through this building. I don't know what you're going to think about it, but God knows all things. Do you believe, young man? All right. I want you to look on me as this servant. Your troubles in your back. You have back trouble. You have another trouble. A thing that you can't get rid of. Something that's taking you to your grave. You're an alcoholic. That's right. You're an alcoholic. And you try to say, you've got a mother that's got something wrong with her hip, and she's a preacher. And your dad is kind of a gray-headed looking man, and he's, he's got arthritis. Here, step right here now. Is that right? I, wait just a minute. I see a big meeting appearing before me. It's in a panoramic condition. It's some kind of a, a stadium. And I'm standing on the platform. That was Hammond, Indi Hammond Indi uh, Connorsville, Indiana. That's what, is that right? God bless you. Satan, come out of the boy. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. Leave him. I adjure thee by the living God to come out of this young man. You can't hold him any longer. May he go and God's peace be upon him. God bless you, boy. Go now and serve the Lord Jesus and be well. Let's say thanks be to God. Believe with all your heart, you shall see, you shall have just what you've asked for, if you believe it. All right. Bow your head before this woman comes. She's got a death spirit. Bow your head everywhere. Oh, God, author of life, giver of every good gift, send thy blessings upon this one who I bless in thy name, under privilege to hear the gospel. Oh, God, death spirit, you've desired to do this so you could send her before a moving vehicle and kill her. But I adjure thee by the living God and Jesus Christ, his Son, that you depart and come out of her. Everyone keep your head bowed, please. It'll go from one to another. You right back on the woman, man. Don't raise your head till you hear my voice. The Spirit left the woman come right back again. Keep your head bowed. 
For if you don't, it will come to you. Almighty God, have mercy upon the woman. Please relieve her of this plague tonight. We know that people do not wish to be ugly. They're only in two. I pray you forgive them of their error. And forgive me, Lord. I pray that you'll give me power to make this evil one leave our sister as she might be made well. For Satan has desired to do this, but thou art God the healer. Come out of her, Satan, thou death spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now keep your head bowed just a minute. You believe him with all your heart? Okay. You believe him with all your heart? Believe him, you okay. okay. You are healed, too. Okay. Archie, may raise your head now. Here's her. Her hearing aid, which was hid. You hear me now? I do. You're well. Jesus Christ has healed you. You're all right. God bless you. Go in peace. God bless you. Let's say thanks be to God. A woman was... Aren't you a distressed lady with the red coat on sitting there? You are, it's strange, but I see a hospital or something. It's a, it's a man, and the, the doctors are fixing to operate for something like adhesions or something, and that, it's, it's, it's a brother or something to you. And that place is in Alabama. Isn't that right? Is that the truth? Stand up for his healing. Almighty God, in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost, I send your blessings in Jesus' name to the man. Why would you speak over this woman tonight in her deep sincerity if you wasn't going to let the one get well? I ask for his healing in Jesus Christ's name. May it be so. Amen. Let's say praise be to God. Um, you believe me? Because if I teach the word, the truth, you believe it's true? What if I told you something? And if it was the truth, it, you know that would be the truth. The trouble is female trouble. It's causing the drainage, which is, you know that's true, which is an abscess. The trouble's on your left side, which is an abscess on the left over. You were healed when you're standing there on the line coming up a while ago. Go home now. Jesus Christ has made you whole. Have faith. Believe with all your heart. How do you do, sister? Do you believe me to be his servant? Would you obey me as his prophet? You do. I see you trying to move along somewhere holding your hand. It's arthritis. Turn her loose, Satan. In the name of Jesus Christ, I adjure thee to come out of the woman. Raise up your hand. Stamp your feet up and down like this. Your arthritis is gone and you're well. God bless you. You can go be made well. Let's say thanks be to God. Do you believe? You believe what you're praying for will come to pass, lady? You got something wrong with your foot or something. You, you have a female trouble also, don't you? Inward trouble. Is that right? All right, you can go home and be well then. In Jesus' name. You believe? You believe you're going to get over that asthma sitting back behind that man there with the brown coat on? You believe God's going to make you well, lady? You believe as you will? Just that's another lady sitting right there with the same thing. You want to get over your sea, sister? Believe that God will make that sinus trouble to leave you and you'll be made well? You wish to get over that low blood pressure sitting back there, sister? You believe that God will make you well? If you do, you can have what you ask for. If you'll just have faith. 
you believe? Is this the truth? We are strangers. I don't know you, but my Lord knows you, and it's him that I'm trusting. I have nothing else I can trust. I'll admit I'm weak. My faith feels numb, but I know that he's standing here. And I know that I could not heal you, but your life, you couldn't hide it, because that's a gift. I can't do what he's already done. That's heal you. His promise is that. But as his prophet, when the anointing is your ever spiritual subject now to God, nothing can be hid. The jurisdiction of every spirit is now under the control of God. I'll be his branch in him and everything subject to what I would say. Satan's lied to you. You've been suffering. You're going through the change of life. That's been on you, the menopause, for about five years. You take every kind of medicine that comes along, and ain't none of it does you any good. There's not the truth. And you're also anemia. I see blood dripping between me and you. It looks real white. You're anemia. My loving sister, why don't you believe Jesus Christ makes you well and don't have nothing to do with the devil reading? Bounce and go out of this village and be made well. If God is sending you with the power of his spirit to let me know your life, can he make you well? You believe if I curse the thing in Jesus Christ's name, it'll leave you? That's what you wanted me to do. I wasn't reading your mind, but you you wanted me to put my hands on you because that's what you was believing. Is that right? Come here, I'll do it. Almighty God, author of life, seeing that her faith lays in laying on of hands. Oh, I pray for mercy. Those dark shadows hanging around the little woman, knowing that Satan always longed there to tempt her in this time of life. But Jesus, you're always standing in the shadows watching your children. Nothing can harm them. Now, you enemy, as God's servant, I take charge over you. In the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. I lay my hands upon her as God's servant, commissioned by an angel. You know about it. You've you seen it happen. He told me if I'd be sincere, that nothing would stand before the prayer. And I believe him, and you're a loser. And I free this woman tonight from all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. All right, lady, look at here. If God knows what was in your life and what has been in your life, he surely would know, yes, you are healed. You've always been a little bit nervous. When you was a little girl, one time coming from school, I see you're something there, you run over portions of dogs or something, you got frightened of. Way back, that little chicken plaid dress on. Remember that? It's all over now. You can go and be made well. God bless you. Be healed. Are you believing? Everybody believes with one accord, one heart, one mind. It's unlimited what Jesus Christ will do. If I have found grace in your sight and God has given me favor, believe me as his servant. I tell you by the authority of the witness of the Holy Spirit who's sure now that you couldn't hide your life if you had you. And by that same witness and by the Bible that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has healed everybody in this building. If you're ready to accept it, it was done 1,900 years ago at Calvary, and it's yours freely as you can receive it tonight. Do you believe it? If you'll notice, not one thing crosses here unless God makes it go from the person while they're standing here. Or it's deaf, blind, whatever it is. If God can do it here at the platform, he can do it out there. If you bow your heads and believe, I'll ask God to heal every one of you, and you believe with all your heart, you'll be healed right now. Almighty God, I ask you in this late hour of the night, as the people sit long listening, I pray, Father, to be merciful to the sick and the needy here.